Most people want to show off that they have a big house. That's the last thing I want to do. I think what I did here, it would be almost impossible to recreate. Yeah, if I had known, <laughs> if I had known. Hello, my name is Alex Lee and I am from Design Seats. Today's episode on Design Seat, we will be featuring an 8,000 square feet property facing the beautiful lake of Padana Lake View in Cyberjaya. Before we begin, if you're not subscribed to our channel yet, do it now, click on that subscribe button and turn the notification buzzer on to stay in the loop of more fascinating design contents. Some time ago, we featured an episode of the Crazy Rich Asian House in Country Heights, Damansara. In a short period of eight months, that video is now touching base with 2.9 million views. Because of that feature, we are motivated to hunt for more extraordinary homes all over Asia to share it with you. And that's exactly what we're sharing in today's episode. Michelle Kimball, humble owner of this grand Japanese house, is a writer that was born in Washington DC, studied in Iran, resided in Bali, and currently chose to continue her globetrotting life journey in the tropics of Malaysia. The property is designed by Farah herself with the ingenious guidance of a designer architect friend, Anche Osman. I'm Farah, also known as Michelle Kimball. I spent most of my life living in Santa Barbara, California. Not that long ago, maybe 15 years ago, I moved to Bali and bought a very beautiful property that sort of revealed itself to us after. From there is where I started to really do a lot of uh, interior design and architectural design. And I'm also um, a writer, but art and design have always been um, a passion for me. The inspiration emerged when Farah and her family faced an unconventional choice, either demolish their cherished residence in Bali or carefully disassemble and relocate it. Deeply valuing the use of natural materials that had been sourced for constructing the home, she found it difficult to surrender to the constraints of time and the notion of destroying a house in Bali crafted from an abundance of beautiful timber. Consequently, she resolved to transport the wooden elements as they embarked on a new journey. Never did she know the challenges that she was going up against. It was a bit of a spur of the moment thing because we had sold this property and um, we were told that if we wanted those old houses that we would have only three days in which to take them down, which is impossible but we were able to get 50 people to do this in three days. And you know, it's over there in Bali, it's mostly women who do this hard labor. We didn't want to just ship it here without making sure that all the pieces were there because if, if it got here and all the pieces weren't here, what were we going to do? So we dismantled it quickly. It was taken to another location. The frames of the two houses were put back together. So in case if there was a missing beam or something, they could get it and make sure that they were sending us all the complete pieces and everything. The most astonishing part of this project is that this house is an existing home built in Bali 14 years ago and then torn down part by part, bits by bit, and rebuilt here now again in Malaysia. How crazy is that? It took three years every single day and having to be on top of it all the time. I am so grateful because the Indonesian workers were amazing. So I was deeply appreciative of them and what they could do. A 
Before I went to Bali, I was a peace activist and I was working a lot on global peace issues. And so my focus has always been on peace. And um, I love to create spaces that people feel really good in. So you know how satisfying it is. And you know, mostly when people come in here, they just say, oh, wow, you know, I feel such a serene presence and everything. So that's also generating peace. It's, it's all connected. In Bali, doors and gateways are very special, you know, mystical, spiritual. Um, so we have that one gate out there. We start out with these small hedges, but they grew and they grew and they grew. And the gardeners oftentimes wanted to cut them off at the top, you know, because they were getting so high. I said, no. One of the reasons was because almost everywhere from up there, you see a lot of greenery outside the windows. From the outside, you can't even see the house. And that's fine with me. And then also on the outside, when you come in, this is like a total little, you know, nice environment. You can sit on those benches out there and it's very charming and nice. It's a kind of a magical sort of Bali style garden. The front of the house is totally different than the back of the house. Back, if you go across from the lake, uh, it looks like a big, long, completely different image. We planted these beautiful sort of jungle-like plants and they took off on their own. They just do really well and there's heliconia and ginger fruit, so we've got the nice pops of color. This is the, one of the most beautiful, you know, parts here. Both Joglo and Limassan houses represent the rich cultural heritage of Java and showcase the skillful craftsmanship and architectural wisdom of the past. They offer unique and practical design elements that continue to inspire architects and homeowners today. The Joglo is it's very special because of all the wood carving up there. And the more elaborate the wood carving um, represents the level of nobility of the person who had the house. Uh, you know, a Joglo is made without any nails and they all fit together. So it fits together like a puzzle. It's a very traditional Indonesian structure with a very recognizable roof. I wanted the whole house to have a lot of natural light. So even in the jungle where they traditionally do not use much uh, glass and certainly not up above where I put it, I had a concept that I didn't want a single space in this house to be th so that you would have to turn on a light in the daytime not even a bathroom. Yeah, I mean, I even put glass window above those doors there so that the light would go through. I'm very charmed by the, the light blue, the red and the silver and the pineapple carving and all that. And even if the, you know, their condition like isn't so perfect, I still like the look of it. It adds a little bit of something different inside the Joe Globe. So in Bali, that's traditionally how it is. You know, beautiful, sort of charming, painted outside of it, all natural wood on the inside. It wouldn't be painted on the inside. I couldn't use them on the outside, so I just put them on the inside. The upstairs, even though it looks like it's a wood structure, it's actually got a brick on the outside, except for the very, the loft. Lima Sons in, in Indonesia are only one story, but we made ours two stories, both in Bali and here, because we needed the extra space. And then we made the roof, like I said, to kind of mimic the Joglo. So it's just a bigger space, the Lima Sun, because you can make it wide. So the Lima Sun, it's, it's simply just more rectangular. Contractors we talked to wanted to have a ground floor superstructure, cement superstructure. And so then that's why we used the upper floor for the traditional wood houses. But even though we've used all the panels and things down here, so it should all go together.
The Balinese bathroom design is always distinguishable. Commonly incorporate natural materials like stone, wood, bamboo, and rustic repurposed furnitures and organic ambience. These materials not only reflect Bali's natural surroundings, but also contribute to the sustainable and eco-friendly aspects of Balinese architecture. Because we couldn't do completely outdoor bathrooms here, so I put a lot of plants in this one, and that's why it had to have big windows. So I was kind of mimicking those beautiful outdoor bathrooms that we had in Bali. In Bali, we had the ironwood shower stand, uh, sink stand um, already made there, and uh, so we brought them here, basically just to mimic the outdoors. So I used um, a lot of the pebbles. No one knew how to do the pebble work here. They know how to do it with small stones, but they didn't know how to do the big ones. So by the third bathroom, I was instructing them how to do it because I'd watched enough videos and things to see how to do it. And of course, the solid uh, river stone bathtub. It's not cement. It's from a giant boulder and, you know, onyx sink. I mean, it was, when I saw that onyx sink and all the beautiful pattern in there, I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. An element of surprise in this property is every door I open leads to either a bewildering bedroom or an artistic Balinese bathroom. Speaking of doors, can you make a wild guess how many doors are there in this house? We were informed by Farah that she salvaged a total of 99 doors and most of them are operable. Be it for the entrance, closet and cabinet doors, windows and a few left for wall panelings. And I actually collected doors in Indonesia also. Some of them are quite amazing, like there's an art deco door, I don't know if you noticed upstairs and then all these carved doors and these portals that I think are very difficult to find these days. So we did design around the pieces of wood, all of it. You know, most of these panels are indoor-outdoor walls of houses, of small, traditional Indonesian houses. We use those dimensions. Like, for example, this gateway here, that dictated the width of the hallway. We have a very wide hallway and the other rooms also. You know, everything was made so that the doors and the panels could fit. So that had a lot to do with it and kind of made it a very big spacious place. I really appreciated the Javanese carved work. The geometry and the a little more simple designs, if you can call them that. And then I just appreciated what they did. You know, these are simple people who made these beautiful carvings and they, they put different elements together and it all worked. And even the architecture, the joglos, even though I got them in Bali, that's not the Bali style. But they call this whole house Bali style because it's a lot of wood and plants and everything. I truly appreciate the honoured details and refined artistry of the teak wood furnitures and stoneworks, especially the freestanding river stone bathtub and basins. These embellishments add a touch of elegance and cultural richness to the design. You know, there's an island in the kitchen and then this big counter, and they're both solid, made out of teak wood of uh, science labs. You can tell because there was a there's like an indentation where you could someone could sit. Back then, the wood they used the most was teak wood. Now teak wood is super expensive here, and not as available even over there in Indonesia anymore. Well, um, I went to a, a secondhand place in Yogyakarta. And I just saw these pieces and I fell in love with them. To me, they're much more beautiful than any modern piece I could have had. I mean, I like modern things too, but this was like so overwhelmingly uh, aesthetic to me. <laughs> and then the, uh, the ox carts, they're teak wood. I mean, they used to use teak wood for ox carts. Like this table, I saw that someone in Bali, he had this table carved out like that. I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's very unusual. And so I had him do a, you know, it's over three meters long. 
the secondhand place. And he had like three boxes of those and said, would you like these? And I said, yes. You know, and I had never seen them before. I've never seen them anywhere. How unusual to have teak wood tiles. So the teak root is so unique. It's got holes in it. But to me, that was like very beautiful and very unusual. So, you know, even have those pots there with the holes in them. I don't know, I just thought it was more beautiful than if it was like it's perfect. And then those mirrors, I, I thought they are so unusual looking to see a frame that's just kind of all over the place. But I thought it was quite aesthetic. So yeah, I got quite a few of those. Many of the do uh, doors and items actually got weathered over there. They weren't properly protected in the very beginning. And they didn't look all that great when I saw them, but w with these wonderful, you know, masterful carpenters, they were able to sand them down and polish them and make them look like new almost. You know, we ha I had a whole lot of extra pieces of carvings. And so I made that art piece on the stairwell and we put it together. They could do just about anything with the wood. I mean, they, like they did this. This is from various pieces that they put together. You know, in general, the size of the people is smaller. And so we would have to be ducking our head if we went through some of them. So I talked to another architect. He said, oh, you know, no problem. And you just, he knew exactly the height. You couldn't have it be too low. People get a trip on it. If you do it too high, they can't do it. And so it had to be a certain level that wouldn't be a problem. And nobody seems to pay much attention that you're just stepping over. So quite a lot of them. My favorite spot in this property has to be the tower deck parked on the top of the tower overlooking a mesmerizing view of the serene lake disturbed only by occasional splash of a fish. This daydreaming deck is a welcome respite from the hustle and bustle of the city. It's very lovely now because you can have this huge patio up there and, and yeah, the view is not obstructed at all, yeah. I think that even in Malaysian architecture, they used a lot of interesting elements to keep the houses cool. I actually keep the windows open at the top because, you know, even in traditional Malaysian architecture, it's built that way so that the hot air, you know, goes up. And so I think there's a lot you could learn. And plus, the aesthetic is quite interesting. So yeah, I do think that it would be great to incorporate uh, some of that knowledge of those houses and why it was made that way. And I think it could help for you know, not having to use as much air conditioning and that kind of thing. I, I think there's so much benefit you can get from upcycling and, and using traditional ways. Yet another astonishing episode on one of Malaysia's most extraordinary homes taking full advantage of the tropical climate. Most houses in Malaysia are built with large window openings to allow for natural lighting and potentially a great view connecting to the outdoors. However, we find most openings often being covered by curtains and blinds. We hope some of our videos can convey a message across to all our viewers to be courageous and like-minded to learn to appreciate what's there for us in this tropical environment we call home learn to appreciate the rain, sun, and tropical breeze connecting to nature. My name is Alex Lee, and I am from Design Seeds. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please subscribe to our channel and stay tuned to more fascinating and breathtaking upcoming episodes. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next week.